Hello everyone, I'm here with Greg Smith, who is a, a bond strategist specialising in emerging markets. Greg was also at the World Bank, where he's an economist in Zambia. And today we're going to be talking about what's been going on in Africa, because whilst emerging markets, I guess, lagged the risk rally that we saw from credit after COVID initially took its toll in March, April, May, um, it has started to catch up. But some of the news flow coming out of Africa has been a bit more downbeat. And I'm you know, just looking at the FT over the weekend, Zambia on the brink of, de brink of default over refusal to make overdue debt payment. And there's lots of little noises coming out of Africa that suggest it's not perhaps economically doing as well after COVID as areas like Asia where you know, China has recovered somewhat. So let's start with that, Greg, if we can. How is the COVID crisis? How has it been for Africa in general? It's been very tough, like it has been globally, but the median is often negative towards Africa. But often what's happening among the 35 um, or the 55 countries is that some countries are doing well while others are struggling. And it's important to sort of get into that mix. But, but as we sort of see the global COVID cases hit around 59 million, only about 2 million of those cases have been recorded in Africa. So that's about 18% of the global population with just about 3% of cases. So Africa hasn't been hit as hard hard. And there are a number of sort of thing points raised about this. One is that there might have been less testing, but this is also backed by, by less deaths as well. And so, so people have put forward some, some reasoning on this because early in the crisis, people thought cases would follow like they did in Latin America, but they didn't. African cases rose in June, but then they peaked in July. And while there's a risk of a second wave, people are pointing to demographics and preparedness. And the demographics point is that if you take uh, Japan, which is about 28% of the population is over 65, it's about 19% in the UK. Um, in South Africa and Egypt, it's only 5%. And if we go to Ghana, Nigeria or Senegal, only 3% of the population is over 65. So they have much a much lower proportion that's vulnerable. And on preparedness, like the way that uh, Taiwan and say Vietnam and China have, have done quite well at responding to the crisis because their experience with SARS. There's also an argument that Africa's efforts to tackle Ebola have helped inform them about disease spread and, and pandemics, and those skills have helped them deal with COVID. But on the economic side, it's still been tough. You know, we haven't seen as many full lockdowns, but we've seen curfews, we've seen travel bans, we've seen some commodities drop in price. Oil is obviously lower than we thought this year, although prices of copper are up on a two year high. And these pressures have really put economies under under a lot of pressure. But when I look through the IMF's uh, forecasts for next for this year, we've got about of 195 countries globally, we've only got 27 not in recession, and 12 of these in, an Af in Africa. So joining China, Taiwan, Vietnam, we've got a number of countries that are actually growing despite this huge crisis, and they are Kenya, Egypt, Ivory Coast, Rwanda, Benin, and Ghana among them. And so we've got pockets of strength in Africa, but we've also got a lot of countries that have been hard hit. And yet some of the headlines have been pretty negative. And I held up the FT one about uh, mm. about Zambia. That's obviously a country that you know mm. exceptionally well. Is, that, is this a trend? There seems to be growing fears about African debt issuance and uh, just the levels of debt there and whether they will be able to service that debt going forward. Is, is it country by country again or is there a theme uh, emerging? Um, there's there's definitely a growing theme. Um, Africa in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of African countries had full debt relief from mostly official creditors and their debt to GDP ratios fell to historically low levels. But what we've seen in the years after that, and particularly since the global financial crisis, is many new borrowing opportunities, um, some from traditional sources, the likes of the World Bank, the IMF, etc. But China's been a massive creditor over this period, including for its Belt and Road Initiative, and a lot of African countries have taken the opportunity to borrow from China. And then we've had market access. Although a few African sovereigns had access in the 90s, over the last 10 years, we've had many, many debuts of African countries issuing euro bonds in either euros or dollars. And so that with these new borrowing opportunities, debt to GDP ratios have increased. And 
while these don't look high when you compare them to advanced economies, the pressure is a lot of this debt is external and there's a lot of risks there. And so you need to be looking at indicators such as debt service to revenue and um, external debt to exports. And there you see vulnerability and people are quite right flagging that but among the countries you need to be very careful to pick out the countries with the high debt problems including those that have been pushed into default like Zambia this year with countries with much lower debt burdens that look sustainable even over the next five ten years. And are emerging market economies in Africa still able to access capital markets? Um, you know obviously over the last mm. few months we've seen both corporates and high yield issuance go through the roof for, for, for companies. Is it happening for African sovereigns as well? Are they able to access the generally lower rate environment that will be in to lock in long-term financing? We, we, we've only got one African country still with an investment grade rating and that's Morocco. But South Africa hasn't lost its last investment grade rating in March and was downgraded again last week, but it's still close to investment grade. Um, and, but, and we've seen those large countries, uh, Morocco, Egypt, have market access. And Egypt's come to the markets a couple of times, including with its debut green bond, where South Africa has actually chosen to stay out the euro bond market this year because it's borrowed quite heavily in its own currency on domestic markets and also managed to get emergency financing from the IMF for the first time um, because of the, the lack of conditions where I think previously it would have pushed back on an IMF programme, but decided to take that cheaper and more concessional money. So they just didn't need to come to Eurobond markets. Um, we had Gabon and Ghana come before the um, coronavirus hit properly in February. And then we've, we haven't had much issuance, but spreads are now have now tightened to a level where some high yield countries in the single B could come to market if they chose to. Although, as I said, still a lot of countries have had access to emergency financing this year and therefore haven't needed to. But we might see a couple more before the end of the year, perhaps Ivory Coast, and we'll certainly see two or three in quarter one of next year. We kind of touched on China. China's had an increasing role within Africa uh, recently, you know, as part of its kind of global ambitions. How have they lent to sovereigns in Africa? Is it project by project? And, you know, when it comes to bond investors getting their money back, do we have to worry about China being super senior to what might have been normally a, a, a senior lending into that government? Almost all of China's lending has has been for a specific project, often with a um, Chinese SOE doing the construction of the, the airport, the railway, or for example, the hydro dam. And that's how it's been designed. Um, the government does need to come up with a, a counterpart share. It might need to finance 10, 15% from its own budget, but then the rest comes from China. Some of these loans are below market rates and some of these loans are deemed commercial. And that's where China gets complicated because China is many different types of creditor. It's got um, its Ministry of Foreign Affairs that do interest-free loans, or these are very small. I've seen a lot of African countries build stadiums with this money over the last 20 years. And then we've got the, the policy banks, the, the likes of China Exim Bank, who are investing in the railways and, and ports and power stations. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we've got ICBC and other sort of more commercial um, China lending. So you have to be careful about sort of which type of Chinese lender when you're making a point, but there's all sorts and they've offered a lot. And when I look at the concentration of Afri lending to Africa, you see a few countries pop up as having had the lion's share, and these include Angola, for example, and Ethiopia. Zambia is another country you mentioned that has borrowed a fair bit from the Chinese, but sometimes it's overstated. For example, it only makes up about a third of their debt stock. But this is where the complications come because Zambia's man managed to talk to different creditors and is getting some form of debt suspension from, from a couple of Chinese lenders. But it's really complicated because they've got about one third of their external debt from the IMF and the World Bank and the Paris Club, one third from the different Chinese lenders and one third in the Eurobond market. So it's really difficult to manage this complex portfolio and talk to everyone. And everyone feels they're senior to everyone else. The World Bank and the IMF feel they're senior to China. China feels they're senior to the World Bank and IMF. And the bondholders want to recover as much as they can from, from their lending as well. So it'll be a very interesting situation that will be difficult to resolve for Zambia over the coming months. 
And thinking about debt relief, there has been talk of some kind of debt relief plan for Africa as a whole. Um, historically, that kind of debt jubilee idea, the pain, if it is pain, has been taken by the, the kind of super nationals like uh, the IMF and the World Bank. Do you think that there'll be pressure for bondholders to take haircuts more, more widely across the African region to help relieve the, the, the damage that COVID and the slowdown in the global economy has done? Um, back in March, when things looked really bleak for the global economy and markets had essentially frozen, there were some some initiatives put forward and one was called the debt service suspension initiative that was launched very early when they thought there would be much more many more cases than there had been in Africa they thought there the impact would be much greater and the, the, the plan then was for every credit to offer a suspension regardless but what they found in the months as markets recovered and and some of the countries felt they didn't weren't hit that hard some countries didn't decide to join the initiative and, and stayed out of it for risk of, of losing their market access. And so there's been an ongoing debate um, since then about whether private creditors, whether China should be forced into this initiative. And some of the loudest um, voices on these calls have been the IFIs, and they themselves have felt that they shouldn't offer debt relief. The World Bank has insisted that it's not offering debt relief, but it should come from um, bilateral creditors and private creditors because they're lending at concessional rates. So it's been a complicated um, debate over the last, say, six or seven months. But what, what we had over the last two months is a, a, a an extension of this debt service suspension by the Paris Club and bilateral creditors, which will run until June next year. So a few countries have got some debt relief. Probably the biggest winners in this are Pakistan and Angola from, from this list of, of, of lower income countries, where some countries such as Ghana um, have decided, or Mongolia, for example, have decided not to be part of the scheme because they wouldn't get much relief from, from the creditors. China's, again, tended to do its own thing. It's doing bespoke deals on particular loans. We get some information. Their Minister of Finance said last week they've helped 23 countries, but we've got no details on what those countries are, although we do know in the press that Zambia has secured some relief from two Chinese lenders. So it all gets very complicated. The, the big problem is the fact that the Paris Club does not have as members the new emerging creditors, China, but also India and some of the Gulf lenders. So until we get a global forum that encompasses everything, the Paris Club's always going to fall short. And that's why the G20 meetings are very important, because they put the US and America in the same room. But as we all know, the geopolitics haven't been easy this year. And I think this is going to be a headache that continues over the next few years until we can find a sort of global consensus and, and work together in terms of this new reality of China being a major lender as well. OK, so after the past over the past two weeks, we've had three vaccines discovered, uh, including today's AstraZeneca one, which on the face of it looks best for the emerging markets. It, it, it's easiest to store um, and easier to distribute. So, you know, you've got to be pretty optimistic that COVID won't be in a year's time a huge issue for the global economy. So which areas of Africa are you most positive about in terms of economic growth and in terms of I guess, thinking about their debt burdens and being able to manage those. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how hit, how hard the hit was this year and how much countries will grow next year, who's going to be able to rein in large fiscal deficits over the next two, three years and who's going to struggle. But there are pockets that look particularly strong. And this was something um, we wrote about in Bon Vigilantes back in February, which was as well as this big debt burden in Africa, we've got some countries that are becoming more active with their debt management. So they've joined the markets, they've done their debut bonds, and now they're coming back and doing liquidity management. They're looking at repayment risk and, and thinking ahead. So we've got countries like Ivory Coast who are looking at um, the amount of debt they're coming in a particular year and, and aiming to reduce that and smooth out their debt profiles. So those countries are very important. So they've not only got that, that sort of fast uptick of growth, but they've got this sort of more active debt management that, that helps um, deal with risks. So essentially, it's, it's, we're going to learn over the, the coming quarters what where, where that growth is. But I think where the debt management is more sophisticated, the debt risks are certainly lower. So 
what we look for is growth but also revenue keeping pace with growth we've got a number of countries that grew really quickly over the past decade but they haven't really generated the revenues from that growth to be able to pay back debt and this isn't debt that can be inflated away this is debt in us dollars and hard currency so until you unless you're sort of earning that um those fx revenues from um remittances from exports you, it's going to be a struggle to pay back so we watch those things very carefully but the path of the virus the vaccine is still a a massive load of uncertainty and the sort of the biggest pressure African countries are facing. And for some, I'd say the oil exporters, a lot depends on where oil prices are in two, three years and whether those revenues recover. But that's a very difficult thing to forecast. But on the whole, I think there are bright spots as well as countries that are, that are struggling. And we've sort of tragically had six sovereign defaults this year, but only one's been in Africa, although Africa still manages to get the worst of the press. Great. Thank you very much, Gregory Smith. Thank you.